Welcome to Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology. Today we are talking about circulatory markers. So markers that have to do with the circulatory system. Thank you for coming. Even though we're only going to be together for a short while, I promise to make this time well invested. Now, I always schedule 90 minutes for these se sessions just in case we need it. And I hope you've blocked off 90 minutes and can stay till the very end as well. We might be done a bit faster than that, or we may not. But uh, if you've got the 90 minutes, we'll be totally safe. Regardless of whether your specialty is nutrition or herbology, I know you will leave our session today with information you can use with your clients right away. One thing I've learned over my years in the holistic wellness industry is that excellent healers keep learning. They know they don't know it all. So congrats for being in that small minority who continue to learn, who strive to be your best, and who strive to give your best to your clients. I am excited to have you with me. I want to get to know you a little bit better so I can tweak this presentation on the fly so that it meets your needs a lot better. And so I'm going to ask you to do a little poll here. All right, so you should see um, a screen. What kind of holistic training do you have? and check off as many as you've got. If you've got a little bit of this, a little bit of that, please check it all off. We just had another person log on. We're going to give just maybe another 30 seconds for everybody to weigh in on this. And really important to me that you really get involved. We're gonna have some other polls and some quizzes as we go today, just to make sure you stay engaged and focused and to make sure that you learn the most you possibly can in our time together. Excellent, thank you. So we are going to close that poll and everyone's got some herbs. Some of you have homeopathy, naturopathy, and some of you do energy work, lovely. That's great, thank you so much for doing that. I really appreciate it. Helps me to know where I need to focus and like I said, how I need to tweak things on the fly here. Before we start learning some new iris markings, as I promised I would teach you today, I want to spend a few minutes looking at why you need iridology in your wellness practice. Even with all of your learning and all of your best intentions, you are likely facing some challenges in your practice. Your schooling sets you up for most of these. It is so sad, but it's true. And then the continuation of that is that sadly, you're probably building on what your schooling taught you and you're creating more challenges yourself. We're going to take a look at those challenges. Now, interesting, I was, I've just been asked to speak to a group of advanced natural holistic practitioners who are um, they're in, finishing up their studies, they're in the last part of their practicum, and they wanted to have a speaker come in who had been in the business for a long time. The woman who's in charge of the school who asked me to do this for them said, you know, the challenge is we teach them all of the healing stuff, but we don't teach them any of the business stuff. We don't teach them how to really use this in a business setting. And that's a part of what I want to be covering as we look at some of these challenges with you. Challenge number one is not knowing exactly where to start in your recommendations or how to set therapeutic priorities. And the challenge here is that you've got training, you've got a lot of education behind you. And as you're working with a client, going through their shopping list of symptoms, you have a lot of information floating around in your head and you could make a ton of recommendations. And they'd all be good recommendations, right? But you're realizing that you can't do that maybe. Or maybe you've got an intake form that is eternally long and it asks a lot of very broad, very general questions that, or even very specific questions, but they're primarily mostly irrelevant for what you, your client needs your help with. So maybe one of the things you'd like help with is to learn how to 
find your starting point and how to create a therapeutic sequence, something that says we're going to start here and then we're going to move here and then we're going to move here, then we're going to move here, so that you have a logical progression. Challenge number two is that many nutritionists and herbalists spend their own time outside of their client time doing research and program development for their clients. Now, I'm not saying it's bad to do research because we do need to continue learning. I totally agree with you on that. It's the program development on your own time that kind of gets me here. We sometimes feel like we need to compete with the medical world, that we need to be so much better than they are, and maybe there's some truth to that. But because of that, we often will spend our own time unpaid time doing this program development for our clients and that's probably how you were taught to do it in school right you were probably given a case study and you needed to take that history and develop it into everything that you can find that's wrong with them and everything that you would suggest that they should do to get better now that's a bit of a problem because that's often a lot of homework right and you want you still want to feel like you're giving good value for the money they've paid you, but you're actually maybe fire hosing them. You're giving them way more than they bargained for. And that leads to the third thing that goes on is that we overwhelm our clients with so much information that they don't come back after the second consultation. They come in the first time to tell you what's wrong, to see if you can help them. They come in the second time to get that magnificent, beautiful report that you've written for them that gives them everything they need to know for the rest of their life. Whoops. And it creates a problem because it's way too much information. And they either think, I could never do all of that. Forget this. I had clients tell me that in my early days. Or they're saying, well, I picked out the two pieces of information I need. I'm good to go now. And that's where they don't come back. Do any of these sound like you? Maybe a little like I've been watching you? If, it, if any of this sounds like you, raise your hand for me so I can see if I'm preaching to the choir or not. Yeah, a few of you? All right, well, we're going to start helping you with that because I'm going to show you how to correct those problems in one fell swoop. If, how do I know that those are your challenges, though? How would I possibly know that? Well, I kind of alluded to it earlier, and it's because I've been there myself. You know, at one point early on in my practice, I gave so much complicated homework to my clients, and I was using iridology. I was just using it wrong, using it all wrong. And no one taught me how to break the homework down into doable, non-threatening pieces. And that's a part of what I'm going to be teaching you a bit of today and a bit of two weeks from now. I hope you'll join me then as well. And number two is I've interviewed a lot of holistic nutritionists and herbalists and other practitioners, and almost every one of them have been there too. Spending extra time creating these detailed reports, these extensive reports, and creating all of this information for our clients, it just overwhelms our clients. So if you're there now, you are so not alone. So not alone. Who am I and what qualifies me to share this practice changing information with you? Well, I've been a holistic health coach since 1981. Now, I have no idea knowing how old any of you are or how long you've been in practice, but that might be longer then, yeah, okay, I'm dating myself. Master herbalist since 1983, nutritional consulting practitioner since 94, natural nutrition clinical practice, practitioner 2016. See, I keep learning as well, just like you do. Certified iridologist since 93, certified comprehensive iridology instructor since 2016. Teacher of wellness professionals since 1985. You know, when I started back in those early 80s, we didn't have very many classes. We didn't have the internet. My goodness, phones still had cords back then, right? <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. And that's the truth. There wasn't much to choose from back then. We had Jethro Claus's Back to Eden. You might know that book or you might not. And a few of those oldies but goodies. And that was about it.
If we wanted classes, we had to travel. California and Arizona were two hotbeds. I'm also the wife of one, the mom of seven, and the grandma of seven. Those are truly my crowning glories. And in all of those years, I will guarantee I've made every mistake a person can make in holistic practice. I've done it while raising those children, so I do know what busy looks like. And I've invested a lot of time and a lot of money. Some of it not very wisely because the investment and the training didn't take me anywhere useful. Some of it very wisely as I've learned how to uh, work more efficiently, how to use iridology more, more to my benefit and my client's benefit. And you know, some of those workshops were great for leading me through how to do this well. So I'm hoping it will work for you if I can share with you some of what I've learned, help you avoid some of the wasting the money, wasting the time, the frustrations. If you'd like to avoid wasting time, wasting money, and getting frustrated, raise your hand. All right. A few of you would. Good. That's great. Well, then you're obviously in the right place. Welcome, and thank you for, for sharing that with me. Okay, so here we go. Iridology can help you do these things. It can help you in eliminate intake forms except for your waiver and release form. So that's an important one because, you know, so many people, so many practitioners use super, super long intake forms and it's not to your best advantage, I promise you. Iridology can help you start creating deep rapport from the moment you start the consultation instead of you looking down at that awful intake form, right? If you are looking at someone's eyes, you're asking them what questions or what they need their, your help with, and then you are building on that and looking in their eyes and asking them client-specific questions, you're developing very intimate rapport very quickly. It will help you do a core assessment in less than five minutes, know the right question to ask, prioritize what needs to be done, uh, dealt with first and create therapeutic priorities list for future consultations. It will eliminate your unpaid homework time. What would you do with that extra time? If you are right now spending an extra two or three or four hours outside of your consultation time writing a report for a client, what would you do with that extra time? Would you see more clients? Would you work out more? Would you get a massage? Would you spend more time with your family? It, I mean, really getting that much time back is just a gift, right? And it will help you to stop overwhelming your clients. If you're new to iridology, you're in for a treat. How many of you don't have iridology under your belt yet? Maybe you've dabbled a bit, but you're not certified, you're not, um, you have no real training and excellent, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. You know, I've had students come into my classes and even into these as I think we see today that have actually been certified by other iridology schools but they've never been taught how to integrate the herbology or the nutrition with the iridology. And some of those people have, have done all that training in iridology and then never used it for a minute after they finished the course because they just didn't understand how to put it all together. And that is such a shame. Those who didn't raise your hand uh, when I just asked, are you new to iridology? If that's you, if this is you, that you've got the training, you, you're not comfortable using it, so it's sitting in the corner, that is, is so sad. And I want you to stay tuned because as we work together, I hope you'll begin to see the kind of power and clarity that iridology, when it's done right, can add to your consultations. So does that sound too good to be true? that I could actually help you not only learn a new skill, but teach you how to integrate it with everything to simplify what you're doing in your practices. If that's true, raise your hand. And I love that some of you are just all in today and you're really helping. That's great. I'm going to demonstrate how easy this is in a moment because with iridology, we can literally gather a base of information from the eyes, let it teach us what questions we need to ask. 
the assessment becomes a part of that rapport building intake without wasting client time to fill in a two or three or a 20, yes, 20 page intake. I recently spoke with a practitioner who's been in practice for quite a few years who confessed she had just spent three hours with a client instead of the one that had been booked. And so there were a couple of points that she then shared with me. She said, and I agreed with her, yes, she's helping the person tremendously, but again, she didn't get paid for those extra hours. And the second thing was her client said as she started to fill out that intake form, and hers was only about three or four pages, how badly her arthritic hands hurt when she had to write. Hmm. So that intake form was not being very helpful for that client at that point in time. So let's get started. To start doing iridology as a, a new person to iridology, you will need a little bit of equipment. Now, you probably know that there are big fancy cameras like this, and I don't want this turning anybody off because yeah, camera for $5,000, I get it. I've got one of these, I love it. I use it for every client, but it's not where I started. It's not where any of us started. We all started with a magnifying glass of some sort. This is a jeweler's loop, an 8X jeweler's loop and a pen light. Or a lighted magnifier like this that has the lights built in. We all started here. And to be honest with you, I use these still in every session. So yes, I do take pictures of my client's eyes so I can blow it up on my computer screen and show my client what I'm talking about. But there are lots of times when I'm in a session, I've, maybe I've done their pictures already, but I have, I'm just loading them up. I think, oh, I really want to see this right now. I will pull out my handy dandy little portable, super low tech, but oh so useful pieces of equipment and just take a little look with my handheld. Now the handheld is really important too for children. If you're going to work with young children or if you're going to work with really elderly people whose eyelids tend to be droopy, our eyelids get droopier as we get older. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but they do and it's really hard for them to open their eyes wide enough to actually get a good eye photo but I can lift their lid or have them lift their lid and look with my handheld equipment and get what I need. They don't really care to see the picture sometimes and little kids, it's just beyond them oftentimes. So, you know, having the handheld equipment is a brilliant place to start. What you really wanna do here is get a really good white light pen light. I don't care whether it's LED or halogen or whatever, whatever but it needs to be a really white light so it's not distorting the colors you're going to see. And then I suggest that you have three strengths of magnifying devices, a 3X, a 5X, and a 10X. And the reason for that is when you're just starting out, a 3X and maybe a 5X are really good, not so much for seeing detail, but for learning how to get the magnifying glass in the right position to see what you want to see. And as you get more adept at that, then moving up to the 10X is a really excellent thing to have available. So you can use the lower magnifications to get your orientation, then pop into your higher magnifications to see the detail you want to see. I really like having the separate uh, pen light from the magnifier because it lets me move the light around and cast shadows or highlight different things. And that's important because we're gonna see later on, I've got photos from a client that's, where the photos are six years old and, and photos that are brand new. And you'll see how a difference in lighting makes things look different. And so that's a useful tool. I also like having the built-in light because that's one-handed operation. And so it's a little simpler. So I like having both, and really you can get um, get a jeweler's loop that's an 8X, just to have an extra magnification, a pen light, and a lighted piece like this, Amazon, Walmart, Target, any of those kinds of places, perhaps a, a, a stamp collecting shop, somewhere like that would have these kinds of things as well. You can get the whole setup of those three pieces for under $100. 
This one on Amazon, when I got it, came with interchangeable lenses of a 3x, 5x, 10x. Now, how perfect is that? So check Amazon for that one as well. And I think it was like 30 bucks Canadian, which if you're in the U.S. is probably going to be about 20 bucks U.S., right? So that's the kind of equipment that you want to be have on hand when you're doing this. All right, you ready for your first iris sign for today? Yay! The first one we're going to look at is the lipemic diathesis, but just before we look at this in detail, quiz time. Okay, so what kind of equipment do you need to start doing iridology? Do you need a microscope? a magnifying glass, and you can choose more than one thing here, a camera or a smartphone. I think I said choose more than one thing. Maybe I didn't. But yeah, you know what? You all got it right. It's the magnifying glass and pen light. That's where I want you to start. When you're doing iridology and you know you love it and you know you just want to dive deep into it, I will put you in touch with the two best cam iridology camera manufacturers that I've ever found in my 35 years, right? And then you can have your choice or buy one of each, whatever you want to do. Um, but don't rush out and buy the big fancy camera until you've got some training under your belt. Seriously, right? Do this in the right order. Thank you so much. Love it, love it, love it. All right, so here is our first, um, our first iris sign. It's called the lipemic diathesis. Now, this set of eyes is a 53-year-old woman who has severe menopausal hot flashes, sweats, and depression. There are no known cardio issues in her family history, or sorry, in her own history, but there is a family history of heart attack and blocked arteries. Okay, so those are interesting to know. When we're looking at the lipemic diathesis, we are looking at this band, and this is a little bit confusing because we've got two things actually happening here. Right here, can you see there is an edge? It's obviously the very edge of the pupil coming, or, sorry, of the iris coming right up here. We can see we've got a haze hanging off the edge, but we've also got a film in here just a, a, again, kind of a movish film that is penetrating, that is coming over the edge. Down here it's not mauve, but you can see that there's something coming. It looks like it's coming over the edge of the iris. It's, it's not really. What it is, is something developing in the sclera. So let's talk about this. The lipemic diathesis is one of the most obvious cardiovascular markers it is usually a whitish color. We're going to look at some that are more white than this. But in its early stages, it won't be white. It'll just be foggy. It'll be distorting the color of the iris. It's always towards the outer edge of the iris. It is also one of the most unique signs because it doesn't follow the rules of iris markings. And that's because it's neither a true iris sign nor is it a true sclera sign. So the sclera is the white of the eye. The iris is the colored part of the eye. The lipemic diathesis is actually forming in the cornea, which is the clear tissue that is in front of the iris. So it's a clear layer that basically protects the iris. The lipemic diathesis is both an indicator of potential of the of the potential, note the potential um, of the condition of the vascular system and an indicator of liver enzyme imbalance. So I want you to think back to your anatomy and physiology that you did when you became a holistic practitioner. Remember that the liver processes all the fats, including essential fatty acids and carbohydrates that are consumed. If the liver does not do these jobs properly, we see changes in the blood lipids, in hormone balance, and in general blood chemistry. Is that all ringing bells for you? Yeah, yeah? If the fats and carbs are not dealt with properly, 
The result will be fats that are circulating in the bloodstream that do not belong there. Those fats can end up sedimenting in the arteries and they can be absorbed by the cornea. Okay. Now when we see this lipemic diathesis, it might but won't always correlate to elevated cholesterol and or elevated triglycerides on a blood test. Okay, so remember that the lipemic diathesis is both an indicator of potential liver enzyme imbalances, potential elevated cholesterol and triglycerides, and potential vascular issues. Now, what you're hearing me say in my languaging here is that the eyes are not diagnostic. We never diagnose, we never prescribe, but we do assess. We do assess. Excellent. Here's another lipemic diathesis. This is a lot more clear. You can see how we've got the white milky film here. We also have that purple haze at the edge, which we'll talk about in a minute because it's another sign that we're going to look at today. But we've got this white milky film here. This is a female age 53. She's a naturopath. Her father died from a heart attack. And she's also suspected of having had a mild heart attack about a year prior to these photos being taken. So remember that that lipemic diathesis first and foremost talks about the potential for liver enzyme imbalance. And second, it talks about the increased risk of fats sedimenting in the arteries, so fats that don't belong there. So when we see this, we're going to ask, is there a personal or family history of any arterial blockages or of liver enzyme imbalances? Now we know that elevated cholesterol and elevated blood pressure increase the person's risk for heart attack and stroke, right? Those are two common cardiovascular risks. But how many people do you know who've had neither of those diagnosed risks when they had a heart attack or stroke? I've, I know a couple, and, and they're both women within two or three years of my age. One had a massive stroke. She's struggling to recover and will never fully recover because of how much of her brain was damaged. And the other one, just a month ago, had a minor stroke. Fortunately, she's recovered fully. But they, they both, neither of them had high cholesterol, neither of them had high blood pressure, neither of them are obesely overweight. One of them could lose about 15 or 20 pounds, but neither of them are obese. So when we see a lipemic diathesis in the eye, it means we need to be watchful and careful when we're, and to watch for cardio and circulatory issues. It gives us the opportunity to work preemptively. Now, once the lipemic diathesis has settled into the iris, it's not going anywhere. It may get worse, but it will never go away. It's always going to be there as a reminder that the liver enzymes may still be out of balance forever and ever, and that's just going to increase the risks that we are working with, right? It's going to hold those increased risk levels. So we want to support the liver. We want to coach on diet and nutrition. We want to protect potentially use supplements that will help to keep the liver enzymes balanced and help to keep those blood fats in check. This is a male age 75. You can see the very clear lipemic diathesis up here and again down here. This fellow has no known cardiovascular symptoms. He's on no medications, which for a 75 year old is nothing short of amazing. He's in good health, he enjoys a very active lifestyle, and he also enjoys his alcohol and maybe a little too much. You know, three or four or five drinks every day, whether he needs to or not. He doesn't need an excuse. Sometimes he's with friends, sometimes he's not, whatever. Remember though what we said about liver enzymes, and you'll remember this back from your anatomy and physiology classes as well. 
how does alcohol affect the liver? The Mayo Clinic says that alcohol has potent effects in raising triglycerides. Well, the liver makes your triglycerides, right? So high triglycerides usually go hand in hand with low HDL. Well, the HDL is the one we want to have elevated. We don't want it low, we want it high. High triglycerides strongly correlate with obesity. This fellow is not obese, by the way. He's probably one of the most fit and trim 75-year-olds I've ever seen. And uh, high triglycerides also correlate with metabolic syndrome. So this fellow's daily alcohol consumption may be raising his triglycerides, but he hasn't had them checked in a while, and certainly may be messing with his liver enzymes. But at 75, he's not likely to change his habits, and he said so himself. Sometimes we have to be happy with simply educating people and letting them be, right? We can't go and make them do things. We educate them and then they have the choice of whether they want to act on that or not. It is their choice. The lipemic diathesis can actually go all the way around. It does not in these eyes or it can be at the top or at the bottom or even at the sides but it most commonly will be at the top or the bottom if it's not complete. Here's the other end of the spectrum. Now this is really a faint early beginning of lipemic diathesis. You can see a teensy weensy bit of it here. And you can see how parts of the edge of his iris are starting to get that, that look like there's something overlaying, there's something coming in on the surface. This one is a little scary. This is a 24 year old male, he's Asian. And because we know that the lipemic diathesis is primarily an acquired sign, there, although there may be a genetic predisposition towards the liver imbalance especially, it means that everyone you see a lipemic diathesis in has done some things at least to earn it. Now this fellow is only 24 years old. He's had gout since the age of 17. I know some of your brains are just racing and you're thinking about what you would do with his diet right now and maybe even the riot act, you'd read him, right? Yeah. Um, and this is a huge concern. If we see the lipemic diathesis beginning to form before the age of 40, that is a strong, strong warning sign that this person is heading in the wrong direction and is likely going to have problems. If we see the lipemic diathesis develop between the ages of 40 and 60, we're concerned and we're going to take action, but we're not panicky. We're not, oh my goodness, we've got to get this fixed. If we see the lipemic diathesis starting to develop after the age of 60, we take action, but we don't necessarily worry about it because it could be just natural aging of the cornea. Now, the challenge we have with this is that sometimes we see the client for the first time after the age of 60, and they have a lipemic diathesis. They won't have noticed when it started happening, when it started building, and so we have no idea how, how serious this really is. So I always... If the person is, is you know, 60, 65, 70 and appears to be in otherwise really good health, I will always address it as a concern and tie it into whatever their concerns are. If the person is over 70 and we see the lipemic diathesis, well, chances are they're not going to make the changes they need to make. I'll bring it up with them. I'll offer them the option. And if they choose to not do anything with it, I'm just going to let it be. So here we see another client, and I've got, these are recent photos. These are from this year. This is a female age 72. She drinks a lot of coffee, typically at least eight cups per day. 
Now I know there's been some research that shows that there are certain things in coffee that might be good for you, but there's a lot of things in coffee that are not good for you. We know that coffee can be really hard on the liver. As I talked with this client and pointed this out, and I'm going to show you that I had had the same conversation with her six years ago when she first started coming in to see me. Uh, we talked about getting rid of coffee and she was adamant then that she would not and she is still adamant that she will not get rid of coffee. She will keep the eight cups a day. She loves her coffee. And so that's fine. She's got good energy. She spends a lot of time outdoors. She's really active. She has horses. And that, that's a lot of activity when you're caring for horses. She feels like she eats well, although I don't necessarily agree with her and all of my efforts to coach her in that direction, no, she's really resistant. She likes what she's doing. She's going to stay there. She just wants some supplements. So you work with them where they're at. If I was to make some dietary changes, I would suggest a lot more leafy greens and a lot less coffee because those are two things that would support her liver. So I've been working with her, like I said, for about six years now. And she comes in, you know, once every year or two. You know, she's not very regular, but that's okay. That's her choice. I work with her as, she's, as she wants me to work with her. And um, what I want you to watch for is actually not an iris sign here, but a sclera sign. So look at this lower outside corner of her right eye. So this is her right eye. Her nose is sitting right here. Right eye temporal side, inferior temporal as we would call this. Look at this blood vessel. Um, and I'm bringing this up because the iris does change. It acquires things. It accumulates things. It can add pigment, but it typically does that slowly unless there's a trauma. It will not give pigment away again. The sclera is much more dynamic and we can accumulate and build and oftentimes, if we do the right things, we can then shrink back or fade out blood vessels. But I wanted to show you how this developed. So this is from this year. Same client, different camera. Okay. This is a 24 megapixel that has um, awesome lighting. I love this camera. This is my original eye camera, which I also loved. It's eight megapixels. You can see I wasn't a great photographer back then, probably still am not. But that one thick blood vessel is right here. And notice how it is not very thick. So this is kind of a, a, a side trip because we're not really talking about sclera too much and we're really not talking about this marking today. But the fact that six years ago, that blood vessel was pretty small. It was pretty narrow. This year, just a few months ago, it's much thicker, much thicker than the one beneath it, whereas before the one beneath it was thicker. See what I'm saying? So this is telling us that the circulation in her lower body, in the liver region, is becoming more and more congested. Okay, not what we want to see. But that's okay. We just coach her as we can and there we go. This is a female age 60. And again, you can see the lipemic diathesis primarily at the top of her eye. So this lipemic diathesis begs several questions and you'll want to write these down. The first is, is there a personal or family history of liver issues? I covered these a few minutes ago, but a recap is good. Number two is, is there a personal or family history of heart attack, stroke, atherosclerosis, or arteriosclerosis? Athero means fat deposits building in the arteries, and arterial means hardening of the arteries. And typically, the arteries harden first, and then the fat and the plaque builds up second. So we're interested in both of those. The third one is, is she at all prone to cold hands, cold feet, fuzzy thinking, poor memory? Because when we look at her, her lipemic diathesis is in the top of the eye. Those are the head regions. Yes, those are the head regions. And so it may be affecting circulation to the brain. And if they were at the bottom, it may be affecting circulation to the feet. Okay, so quiz time, quiz time. Alrighty. 
This quiz is going to be about lipemic diathesis. Are you paying attention? I hope so. So lipemic diathesis suggests which of the following, and you can choose two answers. A predisposition to liver enzyme imbalance, an increased risk of elevated cholesterol, a stroke or heart attack is imminent, mental health issues, so things like depression and whatnot. Okay. Excellent. We've got about 30% of you have voted. Oh, half of you have voted. Great. So the other half of you, we need you to weigh in on this. And let's see what you're remembering. Okay. Looks like we've got one or two more people to vote yet. And I know we just had one, one or two people just join us, so they might they might um, not have caught that full section. So we're going to close that. And I want to share this with you. There you go. So what we see is that, uh, yes, it indicates a predisposition to liver enzyme imbalance and an increased risk of elevated cholesterol. It does not suggest a stroke or a heart attack is imminent. Because again, we need to know their age, we need to know so much more about them. And when we see this building in the eye, it is often preceding physical symptoms. It may show up in the eye way in advance of anything being detectable on a blood test. And it also doesn't have anything to do with mental health issues. I mean, memory, yeah, but not the depression or things like that. So it's not really about mental health. We are thinking more along the increased risk of elevated cholesterol and the liver enzyme imbalance. Well done, 86% correct. Well done. Next marker, circulatory ring. Okay, so this is a female age 48, and what we are looking at here is what we've seen in so many other pictures, and it's this mauve or blue haze hanging off the edge of the iris. This suggests, this is a true genetic sign, it's not earned, it's genetic, and it suggests that it's um, an inherited potential to poor circulation in general. It can go all the way around the eye, or it can just be part way around. So the analogy when you see this is you want to think about how if someone's not getting enough oxygen and their lips turn blue, right? This, and that means that circulation is definitely being impeded. Well, when we see this, again, it suggests that circulation is being impeded. It's not great. We're not getting all the nutrients and all the oxygen to all the body tissues we want it to be going to. Here's another female, age 72, who work with a lot of women and a lot of older women, but you can see we've got that slightly purple haze hanging off the edge of the upper part of the eye here. It's a little hard to see, but sometimes you see it better when you have the person look different directions. So I asked her to look down for these photos and we can really see a heavy blue haze hanging off the edge of her iris here. And that makes it very, very clear. So, you know, when you're looking at eyes, don't always just look at them straight on. Have people look to the side, look up and pull their lower lid down, have them look down and pull their upper lid up so you can see different sides of the eyeball and see more, get more information that way. Very useful. Now, this is an interesting one because this is a little boy age 10 very pronounced circulatory ring. Can you see that purple ring that goes all the way around? Very pronounced up here, not quite so obvious down at the bottom. Now this is interesting because I have four generations of this family as clients. That is just way cool. And I've got photos of three of the generations. The This child's great grandparents have the really droopy eyelids and it's impossible to get good photos of them. But we also have medical history going back to this child's great, great, great grandparents on the father's side. This is when it gets really fun because we start to see the trends. 
when we're talking, and we're going to look at some of the extended families pictures in just a moment, the circulatory ring, again, is genetic, but it's an unusual one because if we do all the right things, it may fade and get softer. If the person's doing all the wrong things, it can get darker and harder and more opaque looking. Now, the father and the mother of this child, they're in, they're in their 30s, and they are in pretty darn good health. This is the dad. Notice he's got a circulatory ring. This is a really common sign. This is the mom. She's got an even more pronounced circulatory ring. And you can see I'm not a fabulous photographer, totally out of focus. But we can see what we need to here. We can see the circulatory ring. This is the paternal grandfather. See the circulatory ring again? Yeah, not quite so heavy at the top, but it gets heavier as we come down the side over here. It's a little heavy over here, right? So we've got it there. This is the paternal grandmother. Now, both the grandmother and grandfather are in very good health. They're in their late 50s, early 60s. And again, we're going to ask those questions. Are you prone to cold hands and feet? Are you prone to fuzzy thinking? Do you sometimes struggle to learn things that should be easy to learn? Do you struggle with poor memory? This would have to do with not getting enough circulation to the brain. So as we look at all of these people side by side, this is the child, his parents, and the father's parents. The grandfather, the great-grandfather, so the person whose eye photos I can't get because his eyelids are too droopy, has had two heart attacks. He's still alive in his mid-80s, two heart attacks, heart failure, and COPD. And that is actually, oh, I've got these mixed up. This is actually the grandmother's father. So this is that way. The grandfather's father has had a stroke. Going back along the mother's line, um, the great grandfather, this this great, however many we're at now, has had had two heart attacks, and it was the second one that killed him. The mother was healthy and did not die of a heart, if any heart conditions. Going back, this father um, had these these people. There was a father that had a heart attack, and a mother that had a heart attack, and the other mother had a heart attack as well. So three of the four parents of this generation had heart disease so we and heart attacks. So we see how things have trickled down through the generations. So what we're striving to do with this couple is make sure that they are doing everything they can to prevent any kind of heart and cardiovascular issues. And we are teaching this couple the same things in the hopes that as they are learning it, they will pass it on to their children and help turning around this genetic chain so that when this young man becomes a father, that he's passing on higher quality stuff. We're going to touch a bit on sclerology because, oh, but just before we do, we have another quiz. Yeah, yeah. Here we go, circulatory ring. Always means an increased risk of stroke, suggests an increased risk of circulatory insufficiency, is blue or mauve, and gets darker or more pronounced with, and it's cut off on my screen so I can't even see what it says. I think it was with age is what I wrote. And you can choose two answers here. So let's go ahead and see how you do. So far, so good. And we've got 75% of you voting. Awesome. And looks like there might be one more person left to vote. Yeah, see, the issue with a small group is I know if you voted or not. All right. And you did brilliantly. Awesome. We're going to close that. We're just going to share that. So there you go. An increased risk of circulatory insufficiency and is blue or mauve. Well done. So, I mean, you'll be able to see that with your handheld iridology equipment. Well done. Let's talk about a meandering vessel now. The iris shows primarily genetic traits with some ability to acquire markings over time. So we've talked about how the iris can accumulate pigment a little bit. 
The sclera, or the white of the eye, however, shows a much more dynamic situation, and it shows things. It starts to show hot spots, if you will, before they become clinical. So if you're monitoring your client's eyes every six months or every year, and you see something develop, like we did on that one before and after kind of sclera that we saw, that blood vessel got thick, we can do a lot of good to help take preemptive measures. When we monitor the sclera regularly, we can see blood vessels developing, indicating areas that need help even again before the symptoms become obvious. Of course, if the sclera are not being monitored or if it's the first time you've ever seen the person, you don't know when the problem started brewing, so you're going to have to ask a lot of questions. So when you see, I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to type this in as an answer in the chat box. When you see someone who has varicose veins, what are some things that you think of? Someone has varicose veins, it could be um, what are the physical things that you're going to look for, you could answer what are some things you might recommend for them. Just tell me anything you can about where varicose veins take you. Just give you a few seconds to type that in and to send it. And if you are typing in an answer, would you raise your hand so that I know um, to not cut you off. Excellent, okay. So Yvonne says varicose veins um, make her think of atherosclerosis. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, okay, and my window for this is so tiny, it's kind of hard to see. Thickened blood, Sarah says, thickened blood, insufficient circulation, free radical damage to vein walls, yeah. Mary says, vitamin C, vascular issues, excellent. Tanya says, varicose veins indicate structural weakness. All correct. Well done. All correct. When you see these kinds of squiggly vessels, we call these meandering vessels, think of them as varicose veins of the eyeball. Right? Think of them exactly as varicose veins of the eyeball because they indicate a weakness in the veins and the connective tissue. They do look a lot like varicose veins. And one of the things that we're going to differentiate here, because we're going to look at a different kind of, of this in just a moment, a meandering vessel will never protrude off the surface of the eye. And I'll show you how to, to tell whether it's doing that or not in just a minute. When we are looking at the sclera, this is a male age 60, and we've got these meandering vessels here and here and here, some faint ones. They show, the sclera shows the current condition of the body. It shows what is developing right now, very dynamically. This is why we want to monitor this at least twice a year, maybe even more, but twice a year, uh, once a year, maybe if you just can't do it more often. These vessels are inherited. They're not earned. This tells you there are problems brewing. When we look in here, we see these blood vessels getting thicker like this. That tells us there's more problems brewing, and this tells us there's more problems brewing. So we know there's a lot of areas, and not just with circulation, but problems with specific organs as well. Here's a female, age 72. She has meandering vessels all over the place. And again, they are earned. They can be somewhat unearned. Just as with a varicose vein, you can stop them prevent them from getting worse. You may be able to backtrack them by doing the right things, and it takes a lot of work. You know, support stockings, vitamin C with bioflavonoids, rose hips for the bioflavonoids again, um, doing things that will help to move the circulation more effectively, taking the pressure out of the veins. You may be able to reduce some of the inflammation there. You can also do that with meandering vessels in the eyes. Doing all the right things may help to calm them down. They will probably never disappear, but they may calm down. It takes a lot of work. 
So again, when we see meandering vessels, it begs the questions of, does this client have varicose veins or hemorrhoids? Does the client have any hernias? Because hernias also indicate connective tissue issues. Here again, this is a male, a 12-year-old, 12-year-old boy. Look at how we've got meandering vessels starting to build already. And he's only 12. So um, this is actually a sibling to the other 10-year-old that we looked at where we saw the multifamily. So I know that I will be able to get photos of these kids every couple of years very easily, more often if I want, easy to get them. And so we really want to be paying attention to this. When we see meandering vessels developing in someone who is younger, again, it portends some not good stuff. So we want to be addressing this. Again, at this age, I'd be doing a lot of diet correction, right? We'd be looking at the diet, and I happen to know their diet's pretty good. It's not perfect, but none of us are pretty good. I, you know, they have lots of vegetables, lots of fresh fruit, um, whole grains primarily, not a lot of junk. There's not like a lot of pop and a lot of candy and stuff like that. When they binge out, they binge out. It was just Halloween, right? They're binging right now. But when it's gone, it's gone. And the mom will take most of the candy away and will dish it out slowly over time. So there's a lot of good going on, but there's obviously some compromises here as well that will need to be worked with. This is the other kind of vessel that I was going to talk to you about where I said this kind doesn't bulge, this kind does. You can see how the light catches on the side of this, which is suggesting that this is bulging from the surface of the eye. And you've seen varicose veins like this as well where they're bulging off the surface of the, the body part. Right? You start with your spider veins, which would be like this. In, say in your leg, for instance, and then you develop varicose veins, so you've got the dark veins that are kind of wide, but they're totally submerged under the surface of the skin, and then they get varicose where they get ropey and they get bulgy. That's what we're looking at here. So when you see this, when you see this difference, you know that this is what we call a porcelain vessel. Now, the, it's called a porcelain vessel named after porcelain where they would fire the china first and then they would put the glaze on and then they would fire it again and it would add a slight texture to the surface of the piece that they were making. And so that's why it's called porcelain because these vessels do protrude. They create that bit of a surface. This is not a hugely common sign, but it's one that you want to be aware of. You want to know it. And especially if you're working with someone where you've got other cardiovascular markers, if you've got a circulatory ring, if you've got a lipemic diathesis, and you see this, you want to be addressing circulation in a huge, big way. Because this suggests a strong family history of, and a portending personal history of, thrombosis. Now, you don't want to go there. Right, because thrombosis is what leads to the blood clots, the strokes, the heart attacks, where the circulation is being cut off. Most people who don't have obvious symptoms of circulatory problems don't want to admit there could be a problem brewing. As holistic practitioners, we need to gently but firmly educate our clients as to what we see in their eyes, what those things mean, and what our clients can do about it. We need to empower our clients. We have the advantage of being able to see, to combine what we see with what they tell us. And this gives us the opportunity to set priorities. And if they're bringing lab tests in with them, we can combine that in. And we are coming from a more powerful standpoint than even a medical doctor, because we are seeing not just the chemistry, but the actual physical, what's going on in the body with this. We cannot and should not teach them everything we see in one appointment. We cannot and should not give them all the homework we can come up with in one appointment. We need to set therapeutic priorities based on what they've come in to talk about and what we see in their eyes. And so we need to do a hybrid 
of those things so that we can um, give them doable homework in that first appointment, homework that they can be really successful with so they can come back and we can commend them for doing the job well and then use that as our launch point. No one wants to come back if they have failed in doing their homework. I have so many clients where I give them that one or two or three little pieces of homework like I'd like you to work on drinking one liter or one quart of water a day and I'm going to ask you to reduce the coffee from six cups a day to four cups a day. Did those sound doable? Yes. A month later they're calling saying I want to delay my appointment I haven't done what you've asked. Ooh, those were easy. Right, and so uh, we want to really try to be gentle and try to be convincing, get them on board with us, right? All right, so when you understand the iris and the sclera, you can integrate all of your nutrition knowledge. We've started doing that a little bit today. You can integrate your herbal knowledge. We touched on a few things like rose hips, for instance. You can integrate your lifestyle knowledge. You've got a lot of stuff that you can start pulling in. You can prioritize which pieces of education and homework to share with your clients today, in the next session, and in the session after that. No more overloading your clients allowed. And you can create bite-sized, doable pieces of homework for your clients in your client sessions. If you find your clients are not being successful when you give them what you think is easy homework, like what I said with the coffee and the water, you may need to back it down even a little bit further and say, okay, wait, wait, just hang on a second here. What I'm hearing is you're really busy, you're going in a lot of directions, and we need to make the homework even, uh, we need to make the homework fit where you're at. I never say make it easier because that makes it sound like I'm dumbing, them, dumbing it down for them. But I'll say we need to make the homework fit where you're at. Which of these two things do you think would fit into your schedule better? Increasing your water or reducing the coffee? And give them the choices so they can decide which one they want to start with. And maybe it's an emotional connection to the coffee that they don't want to give up, so they're going to work on water first. Great, that's fine, as long as they are having progress in the right direction. Integrating iridology into your practice will help you Eliminate lengthy intake forms. You're going to be asking a lot of specific questions based on what you see in their eyes. Help you to know exactly which problem to address first and what the best recommendations are. Significantly reduce doing research and program design time or design outside of your client time. Stop overwhelming clients with too much info while encouraging them to become long-term repeat clients. So you give them that little bit of homework and you let them know that you know we have these other things to work on over time and when we've got this first piece moving really well we're going to I'd like to start looking at this piece if that's okay with you. So you always get their permission but they can see that their wellness is not a once and done. It's something that needs ongoing work. And this will help you to look incredibly smart, even if you feel insecure, as you ask client-specific questions and create programs right in your sessions. So I'm going to give you a sneak peek at Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology. It's an iridology course that I'm going to be teaching, and it starts again on January 17th. And early bird registration will be opening on the 29th of November. So this is um, this is going to be so important for you. Remember the start date of the 17th. Remember early bird registration on the 29th. We're going to do another webinar like this on the 29th to open that. There will be some some fast action early registration discounts starting on the 29th, but they're only going to be open for a couple of days. And my space is limited. I only take 10 students per class maximum because I really believe, unlike today's setting where I've got all your mics muted, I really believe in doing a lot of back and forth. So rather than asking you little quizzes in the polls, 
I'll be asking questions orally, we'll be talking verbally and doing a lot of back and forth thing like we would in a face-to-face -face class. You're going to have a choice then of registering for either an 11 a.m. session, uh, at 11 a.m. time slots or the 6 p.m. time slots. So uh, you just want to be aware of that, that depending on where you are in the world, you won't have to get up at 3 a.m. to take the class. Right, so 11 a.m. till 1 or 6 p.m. till 8 p.m. Calgary time, Calgary time, mountain time. I don't know how that's going to affect you when we do the daylight savings time switch. So just to be aware. So what will you learn when you do this class? You will learn how to create programs right in your sessions and eliminate your unpaid homework time. You will learn how to do a base assessment in five minutes or less without lengthy intake paperwork. You will learn how to only ask questions that are relevant to your client's needs. That's going to save you a ton of time right there. You will learn how to prioritize the problems your clients needs your client needs help with. You will learn how to connect what you know about nutrition and or herbology to what you discover using dynamic iridology. You're going to learn how to tie it all in. You will also learn how to do a deeper assessment for more direction and understanding of your client's needs when it's needed. So you're not just learning surface fluff, we're diving deep. More details, you're going to learn beginning to intermediate iridology. We'll learn sclerology and we're going to cover both of these at a level that will prepare you for the International Iridology Practitioner Association certification exam if you choose to certify, they charge an extra fee, but you will com be completely prepared for that exam. We will cover basic nutrition and basic herbology as they relate to iridology. So I'm not teaching nutrition, I'm not teaching herbology, I'm hoping you're bringing in one or the other at least of those, and we're going to tie those in. And regardless of whether you are starting from scratch or not, you are going to benefit a lot. You know, just even understanding the difference between a blue eye, a hazel eye, or a brown eye gives you a ton of information to work with with your clients. It's going to really, from the first, from the second lesson, the first lesson is kind of all just background stuff, but the second lesson when we start looking at eyes, you'll be able to take that information and start using it in your practice as soon as we close the call. This is a female age 20. She has multiple food issues and menstrual pain. When you've got iridology and sclerology under your belt, you will understand some things about her right away. You'll be able to see all these flower petals in your eyes. This is a really interesting case. This is a young woman who is incredibly creative. She's in university and she hates it. She's studying business, focusing on accounting. But what she really wants to do is she has a horse and she likes to make miniature tack for horse models. She hand makes it. Incredible stuff, right? These loops, amongst other things, tell us that she is extremely creative, right? Uh, you'll see that also with this, that her iris is dark at the edge. And you're going to see that we've got a different colored ring right in here. Yeah, and you can see these things almost without a magnifying glass. We see that um, we've got a big blood vessel coming in here and one coming in here. So we're going to ask her about thyroid, throat, bronchioles, which she's actually had some real bronchial issues over the years. Uh, that this is going to tell us that we need to ask stomach questions and it tells us specifically what kinds of questions we need to ask. We see that she's got a bit of a circulatory ring, so we're going to ask about her circulation. How many issues did we come up with in less than a minute there? How many? Lots. So what would you come up with in five minutes if you knew what everything was talking about? And then you know how to pin it all together. So again, we're never going to discuss everything we see in the eye in one sitting. It's just too overwhelming. So we start with things that will have a direct effect on whatever brought the client in. So this girl came in 
with food issues and menstrual pain. With everything I'm seeing, the first thing I'm going to work with is what I see in her stomach zone. Because if she's not digesting and assimilating, she's not getting nutrients. She's got, got pain, but then she's not getting nutrients to help her body balance her hormones and to mediate pain as well. So I'm going to take that five minutes, do a real good little look, make some notes, maybe spend a little bit more time, um, or definitely spend a lot more time asking her more questions about her diet, about her lifestyle, uh, about her stomach about the menstrual pain and I'm going to start pulling it all together into one neat little package. So, so important. So again, the early bird registration is opening on the 29th of November. I know it's a whole month away, but the classes in January are on Wednesdays and I wanted to give you this heads up so you can mark off the Wednesdays. The program is 20 sessions long and we take a couple of weeks off there so I can attend IPA symposium and a few things like that. A little ironic to take a break from an iridology class to attend an iridology symposium, but that's the way it goes. And so you want to block off Wednesdays until the middle of June, right? And, you know, it's called Confident Nutritionist, but if you're a herbalist, I'm not going to leave you out, I promise. I'm a herbalist too. We tie it all in. So you're going to, to get a lot of information that you maybe didn't think you'd get in an iridology program. This is Allison Taylor. She um, sent this when she was seven weeks into her program, and this is what she said. She can officially call herself an iridologist in training. She can write an assessment and read many eyes with confidence. She'd only had a third of the content, and she's already feeling confident. Tons of it, learning, lots of information. She loved the way the class was professional, easy to learn. Stops, we stopped for questions. My eye slides have improved tremendously because I've got a better camera now, and we do reviews every week. Right, All of your content is stored on a, a website that is password protected, so you can go in and review the recordings of the class. You can review little snippet videos that we post there. If you only need to review one topic, there will be a specific video on it. Your textbook is downloadable every week on the Facebook page. So she says, I would definitely recommend this course, not the Facebook page, on your website, sorry, but we do have a Facebook page for you too. I would definitely recommend this course to anyone who's even thinking of taking an iridology course. Judith is a wealth of knowledge and a fantastic mentor. I love this course and I know you will too. Allison was taking this course because she was completing a holistic nutrition, a holistic practitioner certification program that required an iridology component. They had thought they were bringing in an iridology instructor from another province, but they didn't have enough students, so the instructor wouldn't come. These other students in the group did the correspondence course that the other teacher offered, and I know the other teacher, she's a fabulous teacher, but Allison decided to take it with a live teacher, me, and she said the other students struggled to do this by correspondence. Allison said it was so good to have a live teacher to ask questions, so she really liked the live side of it. Karen Choate um, said, having recently completed the Confident Nutritionist program with Judith Cobb, I can honestly say this is one of the most rewarding, informational, and fun classes I've ever had. Now, Karen came into me already as a CNHP. She had a ton of training under her belt. Judith is a born teacher, meaning she's extremely patient and kind. She keeps things light with a bit of humor. But above all, she's a master at her craft and generously shares her knowledge. Judith is committed to the success of her students, even going so far as to take time outside of class to schedule to answer questions. So this is on the Facebook page. Post questions whenever you want. I'm there pretty much every day to answer extra questions. And meet individually, uh, should you require additional assistance, again, I like to do that on the Facebook page. I feel very blessed and fortunate to have had such an amazing teacher and have been a part of her class. I've already implemented several, teach several techniques and applied extremely crucial and beneficial knowledge and skills that I learned in this class to my own practice with great success. Thanks to Judith, I am definitely a much more confident nutritionist. Very cool. Love it, love it, love it. This was, um, this is from another st recent student, Michelle. Michelle Davies, she says, thank you, Judith. It's been such a pleasure studying under you and learning from you. She was a certified iridologist from another practitioner, as well as a, a certified nutritionist um, from another school in Canada. 
tons of training under her belt. I really miss our classes, but I'm looking forward to completing this component of iridology and continuing my education most hopefully with you. I've become much more comfortable with taking photos of my patients and I've begun to implement this incredible work in my practice quite successfully. It truly has helped immensely in my decisions and assessments. Thank you for sharing your skill and your knowledge and your patience. So it's 20 sessions, live webinars, approximately 40 hours that we spend together. Each class is recorded in its entirety. The content is edited into short topic videos stored on your student site for review for 18 months from our start date. The digital textbook is made available in weekly installments. I don't like my students working ahead. This is a very developmental science, so you want to make sure that what we've covered is solid before we add on to it. Each class starts with a review of the previous week. We need to make sure there's no questions. Each week has lots of in-class practice and interaction. We've still got a couple of eyes to look at yet too, so I hope you can stay with me. Certificate of attendance for attending 80% of the classes live. Oh, and here we go. So it doesn't really matter what color the iris is. You can always teach your clients a lot about your health when you understand iridology and sclerology. So whether it's blue or brown or hazel, you see an eye like this and you think, where do I begin? There's a lot of stuff sitting in that iris. So, you know, we look at this, the fact, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. There we go. This person has lots of these petal shapes again. That says creative. We've actually seen this client before. This is the woman who drinks eight cups of coffee a day. Um, but notice how dark it is inside these petal shapes. So that means that these areas are less reactive. They're less resilient. Notice how dark the area is that's hugging the pupil. We're going to need to talk about ways to support her digestion. We've got lots of blood vessels in the sclera. So we've got a lot of circulatory congestion throughout the body, and that, of course, compromises organ function. And by the end of the course, you'll know what body parts we need to work on, what body parts we need to clear the circulation out in. Note especially this knot, which suggests that there may be kidney issues building. We've got this blood vessel that, if you could see up around the top of the eye, goes like a lot of the way around the eye. It's very unusual to see that, but that also suggests compromised circulation in a lot of the body. Often the symptoms that are suggested by the sclera will not have presented yet. So knowing sclerology means you can often nip the problem in the bud. Here we have the eyes of a 10-year-old girl true brown eyes and what we see here is that there is a bit of thickening in that that digestive zone now it's interesting that this young girl was diagnosed with eating disorders just a year or two after that now i don't work with eating disorders i wouldn't know how to recognize it in a 10 year old except that she was becoming a very picky eater and this suggested that a piece of it might have been a digestive issue as well. But when we look at how many blood vessels she's got in her eyes already at this young age, we know that her circulation is already becoming compromised. When you do the class with me, you've got bonuses, tons of bonuses. I gift you with a student membership to IPA. You get the iridology cheat sheet with the questions to ask. So every time we cover a new piece, I teach you what questions do you want to be asking. You have the five private Facebook group for confident nutritionists. People are always asking to join this, and I have to not let them because they're not my students. This is just for my students and my alumni. There is a monthly student-driven coaching webinar, so you can submit cases that you're working on, and we'll work through your cases. That gets recorded and posted to your site again. You can do the optional one-day live IPA exam preparation here in Calgary. If, if I've got students, when I've got students who are preparing for their exam, if they want to come together to do live iris readings for a day and then do their exam here in Calgary with me supervising it the next day, they are welcome to. Anybody who's not my student gets to pay $299 to study with us for that day. I provide you with the 10 iris analysis cases that IPA requires as part one of your certification exam. 
And this is worth $800 because not only do I provide the cases, but then I get to mark them. And that takes at least five hours of my time. And then you and I meet together in a private online tutorial to review the cases to make sure that you're totally square. You know exactly what you're doing. And if there's things that I detected that were weak links, we review those and make sure we've got that information corrected for you. Then we provide you with, IPA provides you with, through me, one full case study to write, like the nasty case studies you did for your nutrition or your herbology. Um, but this is just to make sure you know what you're doing. And again, I mark that. I spend about an hour marking it. And then we meet together, you and I, for a full hour to review that case. Again, to make sure you have got it under your belt. You know this stuff. Then I give IPA permission. Permission's the wrong word. Then I let IPA know you are ready to sit your final exam if you so choose. Why would you want to study with me? Because I've been where you are, right? I have. I've, I understand the financial and time constraints of running a business, taking care of family, home, friends, other important commitments. I understand learning needs and we all don't learn the same way, which is why I have so many learning tools available for you. I understand there's a lot to learn about iridology and sclerology. It can be overwhelming, and that's why I insist that we do it as two hours a week, not as a five or a six day course. And it's less expensive to study with a Canadian teacher who charges in Canadian dollars. Uh, when, when we do the launch, we will post the, the tuition. And if you're in the States, our Canadian dollars are really struggling right now your price will be, your credit card company will work it out and it will be about 25% lower because you're paying with US dollars. Canadians, you love this because it means you're not having to pay in the more expensive US dollars, right? So that's a good thing. Why should you consider IPA certification? Well, you want to be recognized by an international rec internationally recognized group. You want to have opportunities to keep up with up-to-date research. You want to add your energy to the movement to have iridology recognized by healthcare systems worldwide, and that's coming in certain countries, not so much in North America. You want to demonstrate to your clients that you've been properly trained in the most current, valid, and accurate iridology assessment techniques, and you want to rub shoulders with like-minded people. The IPA certification exam, if you choose to do that, is 175 US and it's payable to IPA, not to me, but you don't pay that till you're ready to take the test. So the benefits for you are no more unpaid homework time, more time to see more clients, have a hobby, work out, take a nap, whatever. You'll be able to create your therapeutic sequences that will help your clients be more successful and keep them coming back to continue their wellness journey. You can start mapping things out rather than one here, one there kind of thing. You will be able to eliminate lengthy intake questionnaires. I can't tell you how surprised my clients are when they come in and I hand them a release form to sign, so name, address, phone number, email address, best way to contact you. May I use your iridology photos in teaching? That's it. They look and they go, what, that's all? Yep, that's all. Because I want to talk to you and get to know you to understand how to help you best. They love that. They absolutely love that. They don't want to fill out a long form. And with Confident Nutritionist Iridology, you'll develop that rapport within minutes. And you will be more precise in your client work. So I hope you'll join me on November 15th when we actually do case studies on iridology, on circulatory system rather, on circulatory system we'll have, I'm not sure whether it'll be one or two, depends on probably two, um, cardiovascular case studies working them from beginning to end. And of course, I'll be reminding you that the course registration will open on the 29th. So there's the shortened URL because the Go to webinar URLs are about five miles long. So you can uh, write that one down and get registered for the November 15th session like this. And I hope you'll join me as we take what we've taught today 
and integrate it into front to back iris analysis readings. And there we are, five minutes shy of an hour and a half. Boy, was that good. Are there any other questions? If you're typing another question, if you would raise your hand so I know to wait for you. I thank you so much for your interaction, for playing along with the questionnaires and the little quizzes we did. That was awesome. I really love that. It's fun for me to see that. And um, I hope you learned something today that you can take with you and use with your very next client. Or let me rephrase that. I hope you don't have to use it with your next client, but I hope you look to see if you can find it. I'm hoping your clients don't have cardiovascular issues. Okay. And Sarah says, uh, okay, so let's go back a little bit. A um, couple of comments. Tanya says, sorry I missed the first half. I had a client. Is there a replay? Yeah, I'll be sending you a link, Tanya. Yeah. And um, But I probably won't send that out. I'm repeating this tonight at 6 o'clock. And so I will probably not send it out till I've done that one, and then I'll choose which recording I think is the better one. So that won't come out to you probably till tomorrow. Sarah says, thank you for all the information. Very interesting. Tanya says, thanks for the, the replay link. Yeah, so I hope to see you again. Thank you, and do take care. Bye for now.